Om Namah Shivaya Shivaya Namo Namah Om Namah Shivaya Shivaya Namo Namah Namaste so this is the beginning of the Rudra Sanghita. And of course, Rudra is the expansion of Shiva who destroys the universe at the end of the creation. But the Srishti Kanda, the first section or chapter of the three parts that it's divided into is about the creation. So if you've been following our talks on the Mandukya Upanishad, you already know that from the point of view of Ajatavada, Turiya consciousness, the creation is simply an illusion. But who among us is in Turiya consciousness? Let's be honest, okay? The Neo Advaitins pretend to be in Turiya consciousness just because they know intellectually about Brahman. But they don't actually realize Brahman. They don't become free from desire or suffering. They still maintain materialistic activities. In fact, they claim they have a license to do anything. <laughs> Confirmed. <laughs> so, what's wrong with this? Well, they are falsely claiming to be on the highest level of consciousness, where they're actually on duality consciousness. <laughs> so this is the fault of the neo advaitas They say they have no need to perform Vedic rituals, such as worship or puja or study of the Vedas and so on. Yet, they're still engaged in material activities. See, this is hypocrisy. The famous book by Ramana Maharshi, Uladu Narpadu, begins with the phrase, because we see the world. Because we see the world in any state of consciousness, as long as we're connected with the body, we have to account for its creation. How did that world get there? What is it made out of? How does it work? And which leads to the question of how do we become, become free from it? So we see from the very invocation, and by the way, if you haven't watched the previous video where I read the invocation in Sanskrit and the translation in English, you should do that now. Otherwise, you won't know what I'm talking about. <laughs> you won't get the message. And you won't get the benefit. So go watch that now or listen to it if you're on the podcast. The whole question of creation boils down to the existence of God. Is there a God? Is there a creator? Is there intelligence behind this manifestation? Or is it just chance, like the scientists say? Or is it simply the laws of nature, as the Buddhists say, and the, the whole material universe kind of just growed, <laughs> as Tom Sawyer would say? So the question then becomes, if there is a God, if there is an intelligent creator behind this ma amazing manifestation, then what is he like? And how do we worship him? And how do we please him? How do we approach him? How do we have a relationship with him? See, so the very beginning, the uh, invocation begins with this idea of creation. Shiva is the consort of Gauri, just to make sure which Shiva we're talking about, is the sole cause of the origin 
sustenance and dissolution of the universe. So that's the opening words of the Rudra Sanghita. And as usual with Sanskritic works, Puranic works, the introduction or the invocation or the questions in the beginning that are raised determine the flow and the substance and the topic of that whole section. So in the beginning here, the sages say, well, thank you very much, basically, they say, for telling us the Vidyeshwara Samhita, the first complete Samhita, which is about worship of Shiva. But now we want to hear more. We're not satisfied. And since you know everything, we're going to ask you all these questions about Shiva. And, and the main question is, if Shiva is actually Brahman, meaning he's near Guna, he has no qualities, no attributes, how does he become Saguna? How does he become, you know, the blue man with the crescent moon on his head and um, um, big hair, <laughs> matted hair, huh? And the, the Ganga falling on his head and snakes around his neck. And, you know, how does he become like that? Why? Why does he look like that? What does it all mean? And how can we approach him? How can we have a relationship with him? Where does he stay? Where can he be found? Well, ultimately, he is found within because he is Brahman. He is the substrate upon which everything is built, the foundation of the worlds. So one should find out about him and build a relationship with him. Now, I've gone through this in the last, it's, it seems like a long time, but it's only been about three months that uh, after visiting Jageshwar, one of the 11 or 12 Jyotirlingas in India, the self-manifested uh, Shivalingas, and getting his blessings, that Shiva Bhakti awoke in my heart. Of course, I knew theoretically, philosophically about Shiva and have been studying Vedas for a long time, but I didn't have any real relationship with Shiva until I visited this temple. Even I had been a Shakta, a devotee of Shakti, Shiva's consort, for about five years. And even he has given me visions while I was in Tiruvannamalai. Oh, just about every Shivaratri, Shiva would come into my consciousness and show me something, usually something very wonderful. <laughs> but still, I, I didn't feel like I had a personal relationship. It was still kind of on the theoretical level. Not anymore. <laughs> Shiva made it very clear to me that he wants me to merge with him. He, he has been so open and so friendly and so forthcoming on the inner planes of consciousness and, and so welcoming. You know, like, like it says in Ribu Gita, I am friendly. And he's talking in the using the uh, Ribu Gita to speak in the voice of Brahman. I am amiable. I am friendly. I am approachable. Come to me. You won't be disappointed. And this was my experience as well. So when we contemplate Shiva, we reached a point where we uh, have a relationship with him. We want to worship him. So the whole Vidyeshwara Samhita is about the process of worship from simple to elaborate and at every level of competence. 
But even the great souls, even the liberated souls, even those who are jivan mukta, like Ramana Maharshi, worship Shiva. You see Ramana Maharshi with, with tri, wearing Tripundra. You see, uh, if you go there today, every day they worship Shiva in the main temple, right by Ramana's sarcophagus. So, this Shiva worship is a very important part of being self-realized. It's not that when you become self-realized, you stop all that puja and prayers and japa and all. No, no, it can't be. Otherwise, you fall down. And we see it in the neo Hidwaitans all the time. They come, they get a little fired up, they meditate, they get some juice. <laughs> then they way overreach their position and think, okay, I got it, this is it, I'm enlightened now. Whereas all they really have is knowledge and maybe a little bit of realization. And But they claim way beyond their actual attainment, and so they fall down. Shiva does not like arrogance. He likes humility. He likes one to be, if anything, very conservative in his claims. And we'll see in the very first story, beginning with the next chapter, how he deals with his devotees who become puffed up. <laughs> Basically, he misleads them with his maya. So, it is not our position to dictate or to claim anything or uh, to try to say how others should live their lives. But <laughs> we see we can give advice based on our experience. We see that when people do overstep their actual position, they get in trouble. They lose their realization. They get covered over by maya and they fall down. So, you know, we don't want this to happen to anybody. We want everyone to go on and become fully self-realized and get all the benefits, you know. That's why we do these videos. So, when you hear this, don't think that I'm just being an old traditionalist stick in the mud. I am the most untraditional, <laughs> most radical, most open-minded, most broad-minded, probably, sannyasi in the world. Uh, I came out of a background of radical tantra. But now that I've come into contact with Shiva, I see the necessity and the usefulness of all the classical paths. So this is why I always say to people, you have to take a low position first. Take a low position as if you know nothing and come into this and do all the fundamentals. It's just like music. I was a professional musician. I was trained up in conservatory. And what they teach you is you never outgrow your need to practice the fundamentals. And there's an interesting story with Andre Segovia, uh, he was like the greatest guitarist, classical guitarist in the world. But every day he would practice his scales and fingering and all that stuff. And somebody asked him, why? You're 83 years old. You're the greatest guitarist in the world. Why do you still practice scales? And he says, if I don't practice for one day, I can hear the difference. If I don't practice two days, my wife can hear the difference. And if I don't practice for three days, my friends can hear the difference. And that's not acceptable. See? So it's the same in spiritual life. It's a practice. It's a lifestyle. And if you're serious about it, you'll continue the practice, no matter how high you get on realizations. 
No matter if you actually attain Shiva or merge with Shiva or get any great benedictions, you still do your japa, you still do your puja, you still read the scriptures and study because you can never, never know too much. You can never realize too much. You can never become too blissful. Okay. <laughs> Aung Tat Sat. Aung Shakti Aung. Aung Namah Shivaya.